Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I think people are just starting to roll in, but I think we will get started just so that we can maximize our time with our speakers. Um, so we have with us today um, Denise Penny and Sean Barrett from our Sick Kids Diabetes team, and I'll let them um, take over and continue with the webinar. Thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. We thought this would be a good opportunity to um, discuss some of the foundation of diabetes management, particularly for children in the school setting. So we'll just go over a few of the objectives. And, and these were the areas that we thought we would highlight is to look at the management goals for pediatric diabetes care to review typical daily care routines, um, to have a discussion about a common, some of the common devices because that um, field has been changing, used to monitor glucose levels and administer insulin, and to identify those situations that are more urgent in the school setting and those that aren't as urgent um, situations that um, there's a role for the diabetes team and the family that can help to support the care that you're doing as well. Just a few guidelines. Um, please, if you don't mind ensuring that you're muted. Um, if you uh, wish to ask any comments or questions, please feel free to use the chat for that. And, and this is an opportunity that we encourage some participation. So if there are some questions or some situations that you've um, been thinking about, please feel free to bring them forward because likely someone else is having that same thought. So we're just going to do a poll just to um, get to know you a bit better. Um, so the first question, have you worked with children with type 1 diabetes before? And are you seeing this poll? It's, I'm not seeing the answers come through, but you are. Good. Um, are you familiar with administration of insulin with an insulin pen? Hi, sorry. Uh, can you send me uh, the anket one more time? Because uh, by mistake, I just pressed send <laughs> after the first question. And and I I'm not sure whether it can be reset. Um, if, if you're seeing the question two, we can move to question three and you can have a chance to, um, do that one as well. Have you given a child insulin by using an insulin pump before? I cannot see the. And this is just to give us a little bit of an idea of, um, uh, where where people are starting from. These are the answers that are here or your poll answers. Um, oh. And which may help us to just determine whether there is an area that we want to focus a bit more on. So, so it looks like everyone's familiar with the insulin pens. Um, more, about two thirds have worked with children with diabetes and about half have used an insulin pump before. So that's um, helpful. All right. So the overall diabetes goal is to try to find that um, balance or ability to achieve as close to normal blood sugar control as possible. So for the most part, the target range is four to eight millimoles is what we're using for um, school age children. And the key is to match that insulin dose with the child's food intake and activity. So thinking of this as a, um, a teeter-totter is how we teach families as well. So the factors that we know are predictable to lower blood glucose would be things such as activity and insulin. And the factors that raise the blood sugar are um, food or carbohydrates.
thinking of the typical daily routines helps you to determine um, the impact of, of school. So looking at um, from a dietary management, having structured timing of meals and snacks that are important. Carbohydrate foods will affect the blood sugar values. So um, just as the carbohydrates will raise the blood sugar, having um, meals or snacks that do not have carbohydrates can lower blood sugars. So um, it's to ensure that we have a consistent amount to help balance that blood glucose and flexibility to with the use of insulin for carb ratios with the fast acting insulin. So we'll talk a bit more about insulin to carb ratios as well. So typically children with type one diabetes um, for blood sugar monitoring will be checked at a minimum of four times a day. So three times before meals and before going to bed. And then we say whenever else the ch um, child may be feeling um, unwell or that the blood sugars are out of target, or if they're using a glucose sensor, um, it can be uh, monitored more continuously. It helps us determine if a specific action needs to be taken in that moment in terms of the blood sugar value. And having the, the trends or the ability to look at the blood sugar um, values overall helps us to contribute to ongoing insulin dose adjustment. So the lunchtime dose, um, the lunchtime blood sugar reading is helpful to know um, if we need to make any adjustments in the insulin doses. So typically children will have either um, insulin by pen and that's injected four times a day. So three times with meals and one as a long acting insulin or um, by use of a pump. And insulin is um, continuously infused through the insulin pump and the, the insulin is um, given as a bolus when eating to, or to correct a high blood sugar. In terms of insulin types, um, we look at the fast acting insulin as being the insulin you're giving at mealtime. And um, typically the insulin, dose, uh, insulin types are Nova Rapid and Humalog in the past, but you may be hearing more and seeing definitely more of um, the children come through with what's called a biosimilar. So if you haven't as yet, you may have also seen Prurapi or Abmalog. Prurapi is the biosimilar for Nova Rapid and Abmalog is the biosimilar for Humalog. And basically the biosimilars are to be a biological copy or are very similar to the um, insulin that they are alike, such as Nova Rapid or Humalog. The, the reason why we're doing more of the transition to these biosimilars is based on funding. So um, as of December, the OHIP Plus will not be covering the cost of Nova Rapid or Humalog, but rather the biosimilars. And those children that do have third-party insurance, some of the insurance companies also are saying the same. So um, if you're not familiar with those, that's what you'll be seeing. Regardless of the type or the name of that insulin, the fast acting or mealtime insulin, the action of that is the onset of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so that's why pre-bolusing is preferred, not always possible in a school setting for sure, but it will start to work in about 10 to 15 minutes. So um, that's helpful to know in terms of um, timing for um, when that child needs to eat his lunch following the administration of the insulin. We know that it will peak or work the hardest in one to two hours and the duration or the time that it is out of their system is three to five hours. Some children may also be using another type of insulin called FIAS, which you may be familiar with, which is um, a faster acting insulin. So it tends to work in five to 10 minutes. 
The long acting or the basal insulin is um, that we're using is glargine, um, lantus, and basaglar is the biosimilar. You may also see some children on a um, um, more of a concentrated such as uh, Tugeo or a um, Traceba, but usually that is for the older um, children that are on higher doses. So this just shows you the graph of, of the timing of how the basal insulin works. So how we usually teach that to families is we determine that it's once a day and um, some families will give it in the morning, some will give it in the evening. You may see it as part of the school nursing order as to be given as a lunchtime dose. And that is chosen sometimes when we want to de um, be sure that there is some consistency in receiving this dose that we know, therefore, um, if it's a family that we're concerned, it may, for whatever reason, get missed in their daily routine, then we may have it be part of their lunchtime routine. And then the fast acting insulin is given at meal times to match or um, try to balance with the carbohydrates as well. In terms of insulin pump delivery, and I think in, in our clinic, we're probably 30 to 40% are actually using pumps. And the insulin pump, if you're not familiar, has one type of insulin and it's a fast acting insulin. So the child does not receive a separate um, uh, long acting um, basal insulin. That basal dose is... Um, given as a small amount of the fast acting insulin. So the basal rate is programmed within the pump. And that is to be delivered to keep blood sugars in range when there's no food being consumed or eaten. The bolus insulin or the insulin that they need at, at mealtime is given and it becomes a quick release of a larger amount of that insulin um, that uh, will be programmed into the pump. Um, to be given with their meal and to allow for corrections of higher blood sugars. And Sean's going to go into a bit more of the, the pumps in a bit later. You'll see in terms of um, the orders coming through for the fast acting insulin, the some of the children are using what's called an insulin to carbohydrate ratio or an ICR. And basically, that is a number of grams of carbohydrates that is covered by one unit of insulin. And this allows uh, some more flexibility for um, the amount and types of food that the children may be eating. So, for example, uh, insulin to carb ratio as 1 to 15 grams means that one unit is needed for every 15 grams of carbohydrate carbohydrates eaten. Um, so for example, two units would be required for 30 grams. This is the one setting that you will need to know um, to be able to give a bolus of insulin using a pump. And more so for you to be able to um, reflect on that dose that the pump is recommending. Uh, if you know the insulin to carb ratio, then it would make sense to you of what that insulin dose would be. Another term, the insulin sensitivity factor or ISF is the correction factor. And that is an estimate of how much one unit of insulin will lower the blood sugar. And it's usually um, based on a glucose target. So you, that um, number or target is, is needed to be known as well. And it can be written as a, um, correction factors like one to three, meaning one unit of insulin will lower the blood sugar by three millimoles. You may also see in the nursing orders that we have um, added it as a sliding scale as well. Fixed doses are very easy. It is what it is. If it's five units or six units, regardless of what that child has have um, in his lunchbox. 
in looking at the insulin to carbohydrate ratios, um, there are some tools that can help to support doing that. So there are the um, uh, ratio, insulin to carbo carbohydrate ratio sheets. And I've given an example of one here that um, the parents, we recommend that they label the carb content, the total carb amount is calculated and divided by the carb ratio. And you can see that in the columns here of a one to five or a one to six. And on the left-hand side is the number of carbohydrates. So a one to five for 35 grams would be seven units. BC Children's has actually um, an app. Um, it's called a bolus uh, calculator and it is helpful to um, actually enter, you enter the target blood sugar, um, the current blood sugar level and the correction factor, and it will help you to calculate a dose as well. All right, so I think uh, I'm gonna uh, carry forward and uh, just to kind of build off what Denise was talking about in regards to what types of orders you might see. So gen generally, you know, there's kind of three aspects to what students in school need support with. And that's first glucose monitoring uh, because they're doing a blood sugar check before lunch. And that could be either performed using um, a blood sugar monitor or a CGMS, which are becoming far more common, especially in our younger children. Um, as well as, of course, insulin administration. And we're going to talk about the devices, but whether that's with an insulin pen, and as Denise was talking about, you know, whether we would use a fixed dose or an insulin to carb ratio, in addition to either uh, one of those kind of approaches, you know, is there a correction scale or an ISF um, that is detailed in the order? Um, and again, as Denise talked about as well, you know, there might be the order for basal insulin to be delivered. Um, it's much more rare, but um, it can be possible in some families that need that extra support. Uh, and then if, you know, the insulin administration, of course, if the child's wearing a pump uh, would be specified with the type of pump they're wearing. And we're gonna talk more about pumps in a moment as well. Um, and the dose would be, um, the details of the dose would be, uh, uh, ordered by giving an insulin to carbohydrate ratio. Um, and then there, there may be some details around dietary management um, as well, but you know, and that might be involved with counting carbohydrates, which the parents should support and, and label the carbs for, um, for their child when they're at school and, and doing that calculation, whether that's with a calculator or with um, the uh, apps we were talking about or resource charts. And, you know, for some of the younger children, it's just ensuring that they've started their meal and, you know, that someone is there to support them to make sure that they're, um, you know, eating their meal for what their insulin dose has been delivered for. So we're gonna jump into a case scenario just to kind of give you guys a bit of a chance to kind of work with these orders and uh, um, you know, kind of more practical scenario that you've probably seen in the school. So this is about Muhammad. He's a seven-year-old boy who was diagnosed in the summer with type one. So he's heading back to uh, grade two and he needs some uh, nursing support. Um, we have, and we will talk about this in a moment too, you know, in our orders from sick kids really defined what that support looks like. Is it full support? Is it supervision? And the anticipated length of time that we uh, think that that type of care will be occurring. Obviously, Mohammed seven, he's just being diagnosed. So we're anticipating this is full likely for the school year support. Um, the nursing orders are to monitor the glucose with CGMS. He's wearing a Dexcom G6. Um, and he has a receiver to display that information and to administer the insulin fol following an insulin to carbohydrate ratio and using a correction scale. So we will pull up this information in the next slide, but just to review, um, 
Mohammed has a carb ratio of one to nine, and he's taking Admilog, which is our biosimilar insulin that we're using uh, a lot of really lately. Um, and he has a correction scale. So um, it's just below here, but if he's four to 10, he doesn't require a, a correction, but really for four millimoles above 10, he's needing half unit um, increments in correction. So with that being said, Mohammed today has a lunch and his family has labeled the lunch. And that's something that we encourage our families to do, of course. And he has 47 grams in his lunch and his sugar is 12. So in following these orders, and I know the poll questions are gonna come up in a minute, um, carb ratio of one to nine, and then his correction scale, we just wanted to ask the following questions. So first one, um, True or false, and it should come up in a moment, um, all sensor readings should first be confirmed by the child's meter. So I'll let you guys um, answer that question. And then just a reminder, all of the questions for this particular case show up in this one poll. So you have to scroll down to see all the other questions. Yeah, and I'll just read them out loud too. And I, I can see it on my screen here too. So the amount of insulin required for Mohammed's lunch meal is A, 5.5 units, B, five units, C, six units. Again, he's eating 47 grams of carb and his carb ratio is one unit to nine grams. Take your time um, going through these. I'll just read them out loud. And number three, Mohammed has a sliding scale. His sugar is 12. In following this scale, what would be the total amount of insulin Muhammad would need? And that's, and you have the options between six and a half units, five units, or C, five and 0.5 units. So just give everyone a few moments to uh, do your math and uh, answer the questions, and then we'll, we'll take up the answers. So far, it looks like about 10 to 11 people have answered. Or maybe um, give everyone just like 30 more seconds. Like for me, it's the same problem like the first question, the first enquête. Like I cannot see the, the enquête. Like it's not mm. so... I'm not sure what to say. Are you looking at it on your phone? I don't know if that might be the iPhone, issue. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. My my hunch and maybe and that's the problem. I have a feeling. Yeah, because last time uh, I was uh, at home with my mm -hmm. laptop and everything was working. Yeah, that might be the issue. Uh, sorry, today I have that. no choice. No, sorry. <laughs> I today no I have no access to my laptop like right now. No worries. I think I'll just um, take up the questions here. So um, we'll show the answers on the screen. So um, so more people felt number one was true. Um, and it actually is false. So this kind of brings up a good discussion. I mean, with where we are now with CGMS, they are approved for treatment, diabetes treatment decisions, including insulin dosing. So we actually do not need to um, confirm with a blood sugar check. Now, individually and in working with your clients in the community, the parents might request that if the blood sugar is at a certain level or if it's trending a certain way, they would like you to check. Um, so that's something that, you know, you can kind of keep in mind um, in working with clients and, um, you know, use your, your, your judgment and, and some direction from the parents, but we do not require um, parents to do this. Um, they don't need to, sensors don't need to be calibrated um, with the amount of precision they have right now in measuring um, glucose levels. Uh, number two, uh, the right answer was uh, B. You guys all got it, five units. So just take that 47 grams and divide by nine. And then number three, so in total, you guys got that too. Um, 
5.5 units because he just needs an extra half a unit uh, because his blood sugar was between 10 to 14. So thank you, that was great. I'm now gonna just hop over to talking about diabetes management devices, um, particularly insulin pens, glucose sensors, and insulin pumps. And the amount of progress that diabetes has made in technology and management over the past six years even has been incredible. And it really um, is hard to keep up with, to be quite honest, um, but it's, it's uh, really improved um, the management for people with type one. So um, insulin pen devices, um, can either come in half or full unit increments. You might see for some of your younger guys, you know, your kindergarten grade ones who are on smaller doses, they're using half unit um, pens uh, for particularly for fast acting insulin. All the half unit pens are what we call refillable pens. So a cartridge is loaded into that pen, it's good for up to a month. Um, it, the insulin itself. And then after that month's time, a new cartridge of insulin should be loaded into the pen. So that's the pen here on the left hand side, just to show you the parts, the parents should do that, you know, um, setting up for you. Uh, but uh, just to kind of give you a feel for the different components of the pen, we're starting to see more um, disposable pens on the market. Obviously, they're just, you know, they take out that one step for people. Um, the only problem is they don't come in ha half unit increments. So for our patients, um, this often isn't a good fit. But you know, if they're on larger doses, for example, five units or more, we will tend to work in full units. Um, and you'll see more of a disposable pen um, for uh, doses that are, you know, larger than we would probably see in some of our, our younger children. A really good resource online um, and, you know, can, they're, you know, categorized by country are the FIT guidelines to really support proper injection technique. Um, and there's, you know, a section just for uh, pediatrics. So this is what we follow in teaching our families about insulin administration. And um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a good resource out there if you're um, just to support your practice that we wanted to mention. And uh, CGMS devices. So the two that are on the market in Canada, um, you can't miss them if you watch any TV with commercials, um, are the Libre 2 sensor on the left hand side here. So this originally started as a flash kind of meter where people have to kind of scan the sensor to get a blood sugar reading. The latest one, the Libre 2 as well has alarms, which is really helpful. Um, and um, most recently, there's an update to the app. So if people are scanning with their phone, they can actually now update the app and receive continuous information and not have to physically scan, which for some kids, you know, um, it can be, they can be forgetful about that. And these devices can only store eight hours of information in them. So it is, it was really important. People were scanning every eight hours. So this is kind of a nice, um, this is a nice uh, um, uh, advance in this, this technology. Um, and again, they can scan with a phone or a reader. Uh, generally, you know, probably seeing the reader more in the younger children who don't have their own phone just yet. If they are able to have a phone, um, parents can actually also follow their blood sugars at home, not with the reader though. Um, and that's also similar with the Dexcom sensor. So the Dexcom sensor um, as well has a, a phone and it just um, automatically updates the blood sugar every five minutes. Um, but for some children who don't have access to a phone yet, they also carry a receiver, um, which gives the same information. However, that that can't be followed by parents um, like it can with the if they're using a phone device as their receiver. Um, you guys are probably, you know, very familiar with, with sensors with your work, but just to kind of give you um, a few more details, you know, how the sensors work is there's really um, an electrode that sits under in the uh, interstitial tissue. And what it does is it measures 
the um, glucose levels um, in the fluid in between the, the space of uh, the interstitial uh, fluid space. Um, and then what you see kind of on the other end of things is um, a transmitter that is connected to this electrode and that sends the information to a receiver, whether that's a phone that people are using with an app or another you know, device, like I showed you in the last picture, um, that displays the information. Again, the two approved um, uh, CGMS systems um, in Canada are the Libre 2 and the Dexcom G6. Medtronic, which is another company, has a sensor as well, but it's used with um, the pump. So, uh, you know, you might not see that as frequently, especially in children that um, are taking injections. And to be honest, we just don't use the Medtronic in our population as much here in Toronto. And this just gives you a visual of, of what the electrode looks like. Um, something important to mention um, around CGMS is, you know, because the, and let me just put my pointer here, um, because the sensor is, I'm just trying to get that to work, because the sensor, and you can see it right here, is measuring the glucose, which here is supposed to be this kind of little orange dots in the interstitial fluid, there's always going to be a physiological lag between what the sensor is saying the glucose level is and what it would be if you checked it at the same time with a meter. Because as you can see here in the picture, the glucose first goes through the blood and then it enters into this interstitial fluid and the spaces between the cells. So in periods where the blood sugar is changing quickly, whether it's increasing quickly after a meal or dropping quickly because of exercise, there might be a discrepancy between um, what the sensor says and what the meter says. That being said, because that's always going to be there in those situations, our advice to families is if you know the, the sensor isn't giving you all of the information it should or how your child's feeling doesn't match what the sensor says it is, then, then that's a good time to get out the meter and do a blood sugar check. So that's why it's really great that, you know, you have those conversations with families around your child's wearing a sensor. Are there any situations where you'd like them to check with a meter? Because, you know, probably people do have some certain kind of guidelines they follow. And, you know, I would take the family's word as the truth in that they know their child and they've, um, you know, got lots of experience. So, um, you know, just to kind of get some further details from them specifically around when they might um, want you to do a, a blood glucose check. This is just to show you the screen of what a Dexcom sensor looks like. So whether somebody has, is using a phone with an app or um, the the receiver uh, device. So you'll see what the blood sugar is um, in that moment. And again, this is updated every five minutes and then there'll be a direction arrow. And I'm gonna go over that in a, in a few slides from now. Um, these little dots here on the screen, and I think I have to kind of, there we go, <laughs> put my arrows here. Um, these little dots just let you know what the blood sugar is every five minutes. So families can kind of set this up for the length of time um, to display it at. It's usually kind of over a three hour period of time. So, you know, if you're here at lunch with a child, you can kind of see what happened before, um, you know, and this is more information that the family's gonna look at at home and thinking about insulin dosing and changes, but just to kind of let you know what that information is. And then this gray section here is the target range, which is 3.9 to 10. And then, you know, the other sections outside here, you can't really see the color well, but that's if the sugars were high or above target or if they were running low. And I know Denise said the target is four to eight before meals, and that's absolutely correct. With the um, sensors, they're set for from 3.9 to 10, because remember, they're looking at data all the time um, as, you know, in trying to capture um, uh, that to be in range um, all of the time, not just, you know, before meals. So that's why the 3.9 to 10 is there. Um, 
And then this is the Libre screen. So also very similar, letting you know what the blood sugar is in the moment, what direction it's trending, and also kind of a history on the screen of what it was leading up to that point in time that you're at. Um, so the arrows, um, at, you know, mean different things. Uh, generally, um, you know, for both of them, a steady arrow obviously means things are stable. Where we kind of get a little bit more concerned and where families might uh, take some different actions is particularly if we're seeing arrows falling quickly. So you can see here with the Dexcom, two arrows down means that um, within the next 15 to 30 minutes, if no action is taking, that the blood sugar is going to decrease more than five millimoles. Um, and maybe, you know, if it was increasing quickly in a certain situation too, that would just kind of give you some more kind of data. Maybe you were thinking something was wrong with the, uh, the pump site or, or something like that. Um, with um, the Libre, also very similar, we kind of have that arrow up or arrow directly down talking about the glucose rising or falling quickly. And I think, you know, families, uh, you know, kind of make some more decision making around that um, on their own at home. And I think if they expected you to do something different, that definitely would need to be a discussion that's had with the family and something that's outlined in more detail in the orders. Um, I can tell you from kind of the families I know, um, you know, we don't usually get into putting details about trend arrows into the orders at all. It's just, just want to give you this knowledge just to, for the screens that you'll be, be looking at. Um, so insulin pumps. So um, I know we talked briefly about, you know, the types of insulin we use in pumps. Um, this is just to kind of give you more of a visual. So we've got two kind of sets of pumps out there, types of pumps out there, tubeless and uh, tubed pumps or tethered pumps. So, but essentially they work the same in that, you know, the actual pump has fast acting only insulin loaded in it. It's constantly infusing that fast acting insulin. That's the basal rate. And then when the person eats or needs a correction of insulin or both of those things together, the person manipulates the pump itself, lets the pump know what, um, the uh, how much carb they're going to eat. If they're wearing a sensor, the sensor could communicate with the pump to tell that some of them you do also have to enter in what the blood sugar level is, and then confirm the dose is calculated by the pump, and then the pump um, boluses or administers that dose of insulin. So there's still decision making that goes in with the pump, you're still administrating it. But of course, for, um, you know, children, it, um, alleviates having another physical injection. It does a lot of the math work behind the scenes. And, you know, with pumps, we can work because we're only working with fast acting insulin. We can work with very small, precise dosing. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're really like an incredible tool for, for diabetes management. This is just to kind of give you a feel for the infusion sets and what they look like. Again, this is the Omnipod pump. So that's the pump that doesn't have tubing. Um, this is the infusion sets are replaced every three days. The families do this at home. Of course, there might be occasion when it comes out at school and that's when parents really need to come in and support their child with uh, putting on a new set or, uh, you know, or kind of temporarily have to switch over to injections. Um, and then, you know, people uh, who have the tube, the pump with the tubing can also intermittently disconnect for showers or that type of thing. But otherwise the, the pump is, you know, often worn, um, clipped on a pants or worn in a, in a belt or, or that type of thing. Um, definitely where pumps are going is hybrid closed loop pumping. So that consists of a pump, a CGM device, and what's, you know, in the pump is uh, an algorithm that basically takes device from the sensor and it um, automatically uh, modulates the basal rate based on predicted blood sugar values. So for example, if the sensor is knowing, you know, in a certain amount of time, the blood sugars are starting to drop, you know, the pump it speaks to the pump and the pump will ease back on how much basal insulin it's infusing. It will even suspend that basal rate. Um, and 
Uh, it also can give uh, microboluses in response to high blood sugars and even increase the basal rate in response to high blood sugars. Uh, so the one pump that's hybrid closed loop pump that's approved for use in Canada right now is the Tandem T-Slim. Uh, you know, these pumps still require people to enter in what carb they're going to eat. Obviously the sensor um, populates the, the glucose information. So there's still um, button pushing involved and people still need to make setting changes at home. Um, but we've seen beautiful blood sugars with these pumps, particularly overnight. And when you see how frequently they modulate the basal rate, it's nothing we could kind of do with, with our dose adjustment as, you know. Um, so I, I really think, you know, these are going to be more and more common, especially once the Omnipod people put out their hybrid closed loop pump, which has, is not approved yet in Canada, but it seems like it's approved in the rest of the world, but we'll get there at some point. Okay, so I think I'm, am I handing it over to you, Denise? Yes, and I'm just wondering, in essence of time, because we want to allow some time for some questions, I'm wondering if we should skip the case scenarios and we can talk a bit about the urgent and non-urgent. Um, yeah. So in terms of urgent uh, diabetes situations, it's just thinking of those that need to be attended to immediately occurring at any time and will either require um, a plan for the role of the child, school staff, and parents. And, and we're thinking of, in these situations, hypoglycemia, and when does hyperglycemia become more of an urgent situation? The, all of the children um, are given a package, a school package, so that they, um, and we direct families to the Diabetes at School website. So there are some posters indicating mild to moderate hypoglycemia warning, warning signs and how to treat low blood sugar as well. In, in terms of weight based on uh, whether it's um, 10 grams or 15 grams. And the school management plan should clearly identify for each child what, what their treatment for low blood sugars are. I'm going to skip that too, Sean, if that's okay. Great. We do teach families about severe lows as well. And um, this is a severe low is hypoglycemia when the child is unable to um, either manage and, and treat themselves, so able to swallow or drink the juice or, or eat the tabs. And it's because that there are other um, symptoms happening that prevents them from doing that. So they may be experiencing more drowsiness or really lethargic that you're not able to administer any um, juice at all. Maybe some difficulty concentrating, um, some slurred speech, or may have actually progressed to seizures or loss of consciousness. This is very rare that would happen at school, um, but we do teach families about that as well and, and starting to have some of the discussion with school staff. And part of that is because of the treatment or management with Baxime, which is the inhaled um, glucagon. There is a nice YouTube um, that shows how it is administered. I think it's a minute and a half. This used to be given by injection, but since about 2021, we've had um, the emergency um, use of glucagon through a nasal inhaler. And it is approved in all school age children, so age four and above, um, given when they can't in independently take any oral treatment. It is um, shrink wrapped and it stays in its shrink wrap um, until ready to use. And you'll see that it has um, the inhaler part, that it has a um, area at the bottom, it has a green line. Um, in the first picture, it shows how to position the fingers so that you know how far to insert it. The second picture shows you the, the thumb uses the ability to push that piece in. And then in the third, you can see when the plunger and the green line has completely disappeared. 
the key thing is it is a single dose. So if you are needing to use it or to teach any of the school staff how to use it, um, you don't want you want to assure that you're telling them not to practice um, because that will be the one the one dose will be gone at that point. Um, school staff seem to be a bit more open to when families will supply them with an extra one of the vaccines and um, to be able to use that. So it's just to identify or teach those situations where it is used and, and maybe emphasize with school staff that should they make a decision to use glucagon, not to be worried, they're not going to cause harm to the child. The um, obvious impact would be that it's going to raise the blood sugar and it may cause some nausea or, or vomiting. But other than that, there will not be some significant harm. So it kind of takes some of that pressure off the, the staff and feeling more comfortable to use it. Hyperglycemia or high blood sugar in and of its own is not an immediate concern, um, except if the child is on a pump because that may be um, a, a pump failure. So there may have been a kink in the tubing, there may be a significant period of time that the child isn't getting insulin and that needs to be um, uh, um, uh, called to the parents so that they can, um, quickly come and get the child and do a replacement or deliver an insulin um, dose by injection. Um, and it's important to also think about were there any contributing factors to the high blood sugar? Obviously, if they just ate um, a cupcake because there was a celebration, if the child is feeling well, um, if there are illness symptoms or really high blood sugar symptoms, then they, the child, the family may need to be called as well. In terms of non-urgent, um, we will continue to do the school referral updates based on any um, setting changes or um, um, if they transition from uh, insulin administration to pumps. The communication, parents are your, your best communication at that time. If you have any questions or um, concerns that you have, perhaps that you're you're concerned about a child and their their management, don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. And um, you know, some of that just may be clarifying whose role is what or um, clarifying that um, the parents may have misunderstood or that you may have questions as well. The ultimate goal in terms of um, the, the support that you provide is to try to um, help in terms of management of their diabetes, but also to reach that goal of independence for them. As Sean referred to earlier, our um, school referral or nursing orders is to indicate the, the amount of um, support that is required. And it's usually that age between 10 and 11 that they start to take on some of the aspects of their diabetes management, and they may need more supervision than actual full support. And therefore, it may be not nursing care that they require, but more identification of a point person at the school that can just um, be there to say, yes, Johnny came down, he took his insulin, or they need just to say, yep, that looks like five, and um, the child administers the insulin. The, the key is to be able to support safe participation by the child. So whatever that looks like for them to be able to continue to be independent um, with their insulin or diabetes management. And that through um, your involvement and that feedback that comes back to us and the family is that ongoing assessment of what their level of independence is and, and what, um, Further, the family may need to work with the child in to allow them to become more independent. These are some of the resources um, to help support your practice. So obviously ourselves, um, your e educator at your agency, any of the clinical practice guidelines for both Diabetes Canada and ISPAD, which is the um, pediatric and adolescent um, 
international guidelines. About Kids Health website, we have um, some videos and some resources there as well, and we are continually updating that currently. Diabetes at School is a very helpful um, website if you haven't had a chance as yet to review it. Um, and then if it's specific, you know, the how to's of the pump and just wanting to feel a bit more comfortable. I know each of the pump companies or vendors have been open to um, uh, providing any assistance um, regarding their pumps as well. And this is just a website of our learning hub that I had mentioned about at um, about Kids Health. So there's diabetes education, and it's these resources that we use for families as well that may be helpful. You'll find them under the um, diabetes management and education. Um, Connected Care is a resource. Um, and it will help to specialize um, for pediatric directed resources. And it's a 24 seven um, consulting type service if you have some questions. Um, and we've been working with Connected Care too, that anything, any um, inquiries that come through, um, we are aware of as well, and then help to see what kind of education or um, follow up that we can provide too. Um, so we have gone through the main content and we just want to be sure that we're allowing some time if you have some questions, if you feel like um, adding them to the chat or if you um, have any specifics. 